Here's a nice simple kit which fits perfectly into my beginner's electronics playlist. It's a little signal generator based on the ubiquitous NE555 timer chip. Everything we need should be in the bag here. And this comes from my friend Cam over at Circuit Pop. That's a new electronics distributor specializing in kits mainly aimed at the beginner in electronics. Maybe lost a capacitor there. Looking at the circuit board, it's really nicely laid out with the descriptions of all the components appearing on the silk screen. And also supplied is a list of the components their designation on the circuit board and their values. This, I am guessing, is a description of how the circuit functions, but again, only available in Chinese. However, there is a neat trick that you can do to, uh, to translate this for yourself into whichever language you prefer. Let's go ahead now and build it, and the general philosophy is to start out with the lowest profile components, which I guess will be the resistors. As is the norm these days, the resistors are a good quality, but come with the five band resistor color code, which can be a bit of a challenge to decipher. The best solution I find is to use one of these transistor testers, which will also test these passive components, the resistors, giving us a value there of 4610 ohms, so this will be a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor. So we can see it identified on the silk screen here, 4.7k as R3. As I always remind people when you're clipping off these legs, it is tempting to let them ping around all over the place, but believe me, you don't want to do that as they will find their way somewhere where you really don't want them. I'll go ahead now and place the rest of the resistors. All of the resistors are in place now, so now it's time to place the single diode. It clearly has the band indicated again on the silk screen. Now we can follow on with the capacitors. Note that there are two different types of capacitors, both marked 104. The one on the right here is the ceramic variety, and this is a, a tantalum, I think. The tantalum capacitors are indicated by this oval indication on the silk screen. The two transistors have now been fitted, and they're both the same type, so there's no problem with that. The flat side of the transistor is clearly indicated on the silk screen. Now it's time to fit the electrolytic capacitors and these are clearly polarized indicated with the negative side here and again on the circuit board the negative is the white semicircle. You can also note that on capacitors similar to LEDs the longest leg is the positive. Now we can fit the IC socket putting the notch as indicated on the board. Now we can fit the potentiometer. And finally the pin headers to select the different waveforms. These you just need to carefully cut off with a pair of side cutters. Now the board is fully assembled, I just have to push the IC into its socket and pay attention that all the legs are lined up with the socket. It's easy for one to go either hooked under or outside the socket. Now it's time to choose our power options. 
In the circuit diagram, the voltage is only indicated as VCC, and in the circuit description here, it says that the diode D1 is to guard against reverse polarity, and the filter capacitor here, C1. So we know that whatever input voltage we have is going to drop across this diode about half a volt. The NE555 itself is specced usually from 4.5 volts up to around 15. So we have a number of power options from 5 volts, so 5 minus the half a volt or so, 4.5. Or we could choose to use maybe a 9 volt battery or, or 12 volts, your, your choice. So all we need to do is connect our power there. What I've elected to do is to sacrifice one of these USB leads. I forget exactly what this came with, but it's caught me out a couple of times. It only has the connections for power, not for data. So you can't connect anything to your computer with this cable. I'm going to sacrifice it and solder it onto the board to power our project. Having stripped the cable, we can see clearly there are only two conductors inside. If I was a betting man, I'd probably say that the, the pink one should be the positive. Let's just check with our meter. Yes, yeah, so 5.12 volts. Get that soldered onto the board. I've applied the power now and connected my little oscilloscope so that we can see the waveform. At the moment it's set for the sine wave, obviously. And if we look at the screen here, the period of the waveform is one, two, three, four, five divisions at 0.2 of a millisecond per division, which gives us one millisecond. Frequency is equal to one over the time, so one over one millisecond is one kilohertz. If I now change the jumper on the board from sine wave to the triangular wave, to be honest, it doesn't look hugely different, but uh, it's definitely more triangular. We move now on to the sawtooth. So the sawtooth also is a little bit rounded off, but for such a simple circuit, it is hardly surprising. And finally, on the square wave, we can see it there, not too bad at all. Let's just move it back to the sine wave. So if you're wondering what the sound of a sine wave at one gigahertz is, I've hooked the output up to uh, an old PC speaker. And OK, it's not terribly loud, but uh, you can hear there the one kilohertz tone. You could perhaps use this circuit to maybe troubleshoot an amplifier if it wasn't working. You could put this in the input and trace the circuit through. If you're wondering how to change the frequency, if we look back at the circuit diagram, the components here, these two resistors and the capacitor, set both the frequency and the duty cycle of the square wave. Really, to change the frequency, you have to change this capacitor here. Let's now take a quick look at a website where you can change these values and see what the resultant frequency is going to be. All in all, I like this little board. It's very basic, but it gives you some practice in soldering and identifying components. Simple to assemble and is another small step down the road of your electronics discovery.